Welcome to the Unscripted SEO Interview Podcast. Yes, it's 100% unscripted, 100% unrehearsed, 100% unedited, and 100% real. I'm your host, Mark A. Preston. And my guest today is somebody I've known for a while, and I've been on boards with him, and he's worked at very high level within companies. But I don't want to do him any injustice, so I'd like him to introduce himself. Hello. Hey, Mark. Thanks for having me on. Um, yeah, this is a pleasure to introduce myself. So the the short version is I'm, I'm an advisor to fast growing startups uh, and I write a weekly newsletter. I think that's that's kind of the shortest intro I could give. But to paint a big bit of a bigger picture for uh, people, for the audience. Um, so I'm, I'm Kevin Indig. I've been working with companies like uh, Snapchat, Reddit, Dropbox, Hims, Ramp, Bounce, uh, as clients and then uh, at companies, leading teams like Shopify, G2, and Atlassian. I'm also writing the Growth Memo, which is a weekly newsletter and essentially something like a like a commentary on uh, you know uh, the broader SEO landscape, the web, tech. It's kind of a it's kind of hard to point out exactly what it is, but I've been uh, you know humbled by having now over twelve thousand subscribers. Um, so there's something in there that resonates with people. And that's really how I spend my time. I'm a dad. Uh, I was born and raised in Germany and now live in the States, spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley, now live in a small, tiny town in Michigan that most people never have heard of. And I think that's that's most of the things you need to know about me. Brilliant. Now, how did you get into the industry right at the beginning? When was that? And what's your sort of personal journey been like from then till where you are now? I started professionally, meaning being paid for SEO about 15 years ago, almost exactly 15 years ago, in Germany at an agency. And uh, what really brought me on the track of SEO, because at the time it was not this very well-known thing that it is today, was very different, a bit more hacky, a bit more spammy, a bit more mysterious. And what really got me on the track there were computer games. I was an ad gamer. I I played in you know in clans with friends, and uh, I I kind of witnessed when when the internet came out and broadband came available and affordable, and that obviously changed everything. But something that changed for me is that I was able to play online with my friends, and so. We applied for tournaments and like games like Counter Strike and StarCraft and Warcraft and whatnot. And uh, to apply for a tournament, you needed a website, and we didn't have a website. So I raised my hand to become the guy to figure out how to build a website. It was terrible, uh, but it's I somehow made it work. And that led me led me down the path of the web and how the web works and this thing called search engines and what that is and SEO. And uh, so that that you know, it awakened a curiosity in me, but uh, I then went on to study business. I should have studied something like computer science or, you know, something more technical. I studied business. Uh, and I think you can, you can tell by, by the things that I focus on and the things that I write about today that I studied business instead of computer science. Uh, but anyway, I, uh, I went down the business path and then uh, did a little pivot into banking. I thought for a while I was going to go into private banking or investment banking, did that for about a year and then realized, yeah, that's not kind of the the up and coming, you know, part of the world or or, or place to be. And so I, I corrected and went to an agency where I started as a trainee, uh, eventually became a consultant. And my luck was that, first of all, this was a fantastic agency. They taught me a lot in very fast time. And second, that agency had enterprise clients, really big companies, public companies, uh, large websites. And that was that was a, a big, you know, um, accelerator for me because you get exposed to these big problems and work with these big companies, and that has helped me today. So I've done about I did about five years of agency life in Germany. Uh, then I moved to the states. My father is American, so I have a dual citizenship. I always wanted to be in the states. And in 2014, I got the chance when Marcus Tober, the founder of Searchmetrics, uh, which has now been acquired by a conductor. Um, and Marcus, by the way, builds enterprise products at SEMrush, and we we collaborated a lot on that. So uh, you know, there's some interesting stuff going on there. Uh, but he, in 2014, gave me the chance by sending me over to the Silicon Valley and had me work on accounts like eBay and uh, Yellow Pages and Columbia Sportswear, etc. And uh, that set me on the path. You know, I was in the Valley, and then eventually I, I joined 
a company called Daily Motion. Then I went to Atlassian, then to G2 and Shopify. And uh, it really set me on a fast track in terms of responsibility and management and, and knowledge. And uh, then two years ago, I went out on my own as an advisor. And now I just basically advise executives at companies how to think about SEO uh, and, and things like product-led growth. It's really not just SEO anymore, but of course, always SEO will be at my heart and kind of a pillar in my work. Wonderful. Now, I have to ask, what did you build that very first site in? What was it? Man, that was basically, so what I did is I, I, I quote unquote designed the website in Photoshop and then I exported it to Illustrator where I basically sliced the, the design into tables and then exported it into HTML and basically added some, some tables and iframes and somehow made it work that way. But it was as Frankenstein as you could imagine it. Yeah, well, I've, I've built quite a few of them in my early days. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> but working with these very vast and large companies, do you think your background in studying business has really helped you? You know, I would say yes. And I will also say that had I have, if, if I had the maturity that I have today that I had when I went to college, I would have gotten so much more out of it, right? So I will acknowledge that I I was, I studied because I knew I needed to study, but I wasn't fascinated by business. And I, today I very much am, and I really am. I really enjoy all that stuff. But uh, at the time I just, you know, it was just interesting in other things. And so it, it has helped and it would have helped even more had I put in more work. Right. So f for the people listening to this, I mean, from the outside, think, oh, well, you know, you you started in the big co blue chip companies. You started working with them through the agencies. You was given the opportunity. So for anyone listening to this who's not fortunate enough to already be working in that market, who would like to, what advice would you have for them? Joining a large agency that has these kind of clients is probably one of the fastest ways to get exposure to large sites, right? And there's obviously an element of working your way up. So as a trainee in the beginning, I, you know, the first couple of months, I was just trained, as the name says, which, uh, you know, was my fortune because I don't know if a lot of companies still train their trainees. Anyway, um, so at the very beginning, it was I was doing like very scrappy work. And that has been a, a pattern through all of my life. Like I never shied away from, you know, scrubbing the toilets, not literally, but figuratively. Um, and then people took me to client meetings and I just observed. And then eventually I was allowed to do some reports uh, and learn about, you know, how to report numbers and so on. So Anyway, um, there's an element of working up, and I think agencies are fast track there, or or joining a company. Um, you know, uh, I think especially these days, most big companies have some sort of an SEO program, and uh, I think I think you know working at the company to see it from the inside out has its merits too. Now, I will say that I really benefited from working at an agency early on because you get that horizontal view of common problems across different companies. And I kind of came full circle because that's the same thing that I'm to today, doing today. And that's the same value that I can offer my clients is, look, I, I observe many problem, uh, one problems, one problem across many companies. Um, and that helped me in the beginning a lot. Whereas if I had joined in-house, right, I would have developed a lot of expertise at that uh, within that vertical and company, but you don't really have that horizontal view. So pros and cons to both, but I think either joining a large company or joining an agency that has large companies as clients is probably the best way to go. Right. It's interesting you mentioned that because uh, somebody I was speaking to who works in the enterprise SEO space, they said it's not climbing the ladder, it's just a different ladder. And I think that's the best way to look at this. Like for, for a lot of people listening and watching this, they think, you know, working in the real vast companies is like you need to go up the top of the ladder, but it's just a different ladder. Because have you do you feel that working in the industry? 
Yeah, look, I, I I can tell you from my personal experience that um, there are different letters at companies and you want to be very careful which one you pick. For me, I always wanted to like wanted to climb up the ranks in terms of title as much as possible, manage as many people as possible, right? Get as much responsibility as possible. To me, that was always the golden path to success. And I, you know, I, I reached, I think a peak at Shopify where I managed an organization of 80 to a hundred people. And, uh, and it was quite intense. And I, I don't think I'm a bad people manager per se, but I will say that in hindsight, I'm much happier not being in in in, in that kind of uh, management position anymore. Um, not just because of the intensity, but also because the work is 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 just very specific, right? The higher you climb up the ranks and management track, the more time you spend basically on managing people and less in the craft itself. Which is why at some point it doesn't really manage uh, matter as much what type of organization you lead because the the 80 percent is spent on just basically you know uh, operations and implementation and execution and hiring and that kind of stuff and there are lots of universal principles but what I want to encourage people to think about is that more companies offer individual contributor tracks where you know maybe you become a principal like Google and meta they have that right they have like Jeff Dean at Google one of the you know, world's best experts in AI, he's an individual contributor. He doesn't manage anyone. And that's because he's so incredibly smart that his time would be completely wasted on managing people. And that is something that I want to encourage people to explore more. I personally had several instances where I promoted individual contributors to managers and they hated it and they begged me to to become an individual contributor again. So when we talk about ladders, like I just want to paint the path that even in an agency, right? Like it, it doesn't always have to involve managing people if that's not something that you truly enjoy. And instead you really want to think about like wh where, like which path you want to go down to. Now I will finish by saying you can climb down a ladder too, right? Like just because you explore management path or an individual contributor path for a while doesn't mean you cannot switch, but know that there are different ladders and you're not, you're not caged or imprisoned in this track that you can never get get off of. Yeah, I, when you say climbing down the ladder, I totally relate to that. You know, basically I've been in positions myself in the past where I've been offered very high things, but I just stepped back and said, well, if I was in your position, where would I put me? With my skills, that would benefit the company most. And I think that sometimes you have to look at the individual and their skill set and where you get the most out of them. And I think a lot of this, and like you're at, not everyone wants to manage people. Not everyone wants to climb the ladder. You know, and it's so important that, we understand this in the industry and it's because a lot of it is to be successful you need to do xyz and climb that ladder and it's not like that just like you said it, it isn't yeah exactly you're absolutely on point when you say how can we get the most out of a person and you will see that some people are just naturally inclined to manage and they really enjoy that and they're perfect and they might not be as strong as individual contributors, and they're the perfect managers. And you have the, the exact same example. There is a principle that doesn't come to mind right now, but it describes exactly that problem of basically wasting talent and skill by promoting someone to manager who is just excellent at their jobs. And the problem is that we haven't yet created enough awareness for that, and too many companies run in these kind of old ways. right? Even like, I, I, I for many Many years I spent all of my time at, at these like Silicon Valley tech companies, um, who are what I would call it kind of the forefront of of innovation in many in many cases. Um, and even there, the idea that there should be an individual contributor track to the highest ranks was relatively new, like five years ago. Now I'm seeing that normalizing a bit, but again, I, I want to encourage even anybody listening to this who has their own company, agency, whatever you do, like like think about how you're wasting talent and skill away by by forcing people to become managers to 
to make more money in a lot of cases, right? It's a lot of cases like, oh, I want to make more money uh, or be more recognized. I have to become a manager. And, and that's probably, it's probably bad. Yeah, exactly. Nail on the head there. Like they do it because it's the only way for them to make more money. Yep. And I think that if we give people opportunities to make more money without forcing them to do things they're not good at or don't want to do, then, you know, we need to start looking at that, you know, as as an industry. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look, um, I, I, I observed that these days, like, wanting to make money is kind of frowned upon. Uh, a little bit, and look. To be fair, uh, you know, s some people are just incredibly greedy, and and they put money over everything. But uh, anyway, I, I think generally, you know, we it's a, it's a bit more frowned upon to have ambitions around money, and yet at the same time, what you will observe is that anybody who has reached a certain level of financial security, who has made a certain amount of money, you observe that a lot of these people they do something completely different once they reach that point. And they usually do things that they really enjoy and really like. Um, I would consider myself, you know, having reached that point somewhat. And I spend more of my time doing things that I really enjoy, like, you know, like like dissecting uh, businesses, which I'm doing with my paid newsletter or writing with my newsletter or, you know, um, uh, creating content in that sense uh, and, and learning more. That's something that before I wasn't able to because I, you know, uh, uh, I hadn't reached that level of financial security. Um, and so... There are some exceptions, right? Like there, there are people who, for them, money is really just just a tool and, and they will make a lot of money, but they don't care about the money as much. And I respect that too. But it's interesting that so many people, once they reach financial security, do things that they really enjoy and become incredibly good at these things. And that should make us think a bit more, you know, uh, as, as managers, as company owners about what different paths can I provide for people to make more money while still adding a ton of value to the company and maybe more value um, you know, than they would as managers by allowing them to focus on what's called their zone of genius, the thing that they're really world-class at. Um, and that takes a lot of exploration work, right? Like it, it takes uh, me as I, I only just recently discovered what I, what I'm good at. And that's in the nature of, of the zone of genius, because it is very hard to see for yourself what you're incredibly good at because to you it's so natural it comes it comes natural it comes without effort right but anyway long story short i think most companies would be way better having more people operating in their zone of genius and allowing them at the same time to to reach financial security that's the point yeah i think on the money side i've, I've you know I'm, like you i'm an advisor not on the level of companies that you advise but for me i go in and i want to understand the personal challenges the people within the teams are having, mm -hmm. you know, are, are they forced because of unforeseen circumstances that they have to earn a certain level of money that they can't earn in the job they're doing? Is there anything outside of the bubble they're in that's forcing them? And I think it, for me, it's about, well, how can we streamline things to take that worry away from people? Yep. And I think, yes, there are certain people that basically want to take over the world and everything. But like me, I'm now on a semi-retirement plan. So a couple of years ago, I had to sit back and think, well, in order to achieve semi-retirement, what needs to happen? So I had to change things I was doing to allow myself and my family uh, not to, not I won't, I won't say rich, but to live without worry. And I think that's the, that's the key thing about when it comes to money, it's just, like you say, frowned upon. But there's reasons why people need to earn the money they want to. You know, and I think I think a lot of lot of people forget that personal connection with money. Absolutely, absolutely, and and I would I want, I want to make an assumption, Mark, and I want to tell you I want you to tell me if that assumption is correct or not. My assumption is that you're on a semi retirement plan, not because you have to, but because you want to do other things with your time rather than work. Is that is that right? Yes. Um... 
it, it, it's, it's basically for me, it's buying time back with the family. Yeah. You know, I've got, you know, I'm a granddad now and all I've done for the past 20 odd years is work, you know, to build things for the family. Yes. The family's had a good life and everything, but what they haven't had is time that they should have had with me. And I'm being quite open and honest with that, you know, and it's a personal thing. And basically a few years back, I asked my youngest son the stupidest question you could ever ask. Like, who do you love most, mum or dad? And I come third. <laughs> I actually come second. third. He said, because... You never spend any time with me. And that was a personal trigger. Uh, it was hard to hear, but in my eyes, I'm working so hard for them. But what they actually wanted is time with me. So my personal retirement is buying that time to allow me to spend with them. Uh, but anyway, that that's, that's another uh, story. But I'm interested in the moment you decided to go on your own as a growth advisor. Suddenly you're working, you know, employed in these big companies. And what was it in your mind that triggered, like, I'm going to go it myself now? What all happened? Well, Mark, I, I wish I could tell you this story about that grand plan where I plan out my whole career and then I reached the peak and then... I had this this follow up plan to then be, go out on my own. That's not really what happened. Uh, what actually happened is I got I got laid off at Shopify. Uh, <laughs> to my to my surprise, I, I, I'll probably say. Uh, but yeah, I was part of of twenty percent. You know, uh, over a thousand people at Shopify who got laid off in July twenty twenty two, and um, and then, yeah, so so that happened. Um, and uh, luckily, Shopify gave me a very generous severance package of four months salary, which in the US is not the norm. I'm going to tell you that, you know, the norm is probably closer to zero months salary. Uh, but you know, I, I was I was lucky to to have worked for a successful tech company. Um, and anyway, so I had this runway of four months, uh, I got laid off. Um, and it took me a little while to digest that and, and, and like cope with the pain and grief and all that kind of stuff. And uh, then I was like, okay, what's the next step? Um, and I spoke to a whole bunch of company. Fun fact is I, I posted on LinkedIn that I was part of the layoffs, um, which a lot of people said was a stupid idea, but it got me over a million LinkedIn impressions. Uh, and impressions aren't everything, but this post was seen by a lot of people and also by a lot of executives who immediately reached out and were like, hey, Kevin, uh, are you free to do some consulting? And I was like, you know, you know, I'll do some consulting uh, just until I find my next gig. So I took on a couple of clients and I was talking to tons of companies. And like, I mean, talking about being humble, like companies of all calibers, many companies that that were ready to to craft positions uh, just for me to come in. And um, at the same time, though, consulting picked up so much that I could already tell that no company was able to compensate me as much as I would make in consulting. And so after speaking to lots of companies and also being burned out from management, to be completely honest, right? That was just, it's in-house at a certain level is highly intense. And I was burned out from that intensity. And so I decided to, to just do a bit consulting for a bit longer. And uh, it went really, really well. And then in 2023, so about six months after I got laid off, I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to do this for a while. And I'm going to quote unquote, go all in. And then I went through a couple of, of cycles of learning, right, where I overcommitted and then I found myself in this intensity again. I'm like, what the heck am I doing here? And uh, doing stupid things like charging hourly or, you know, like uh, all these kind of mistakes. Uh, and to be fair, there were great people who reached out to me and offered me fantastic advice. Eli Schwartz is one of these people. Nick Leroy. Um, I'm probably forgetting one or two, so apologies. But those people shared all their knowledge with me for free without ex any expectations, simply to help, right? And I, I really appreciated that. So um, yeah, that, that was kind of the moment, right? Was when I spoke to great companies who, who, you know, my ego would have loved to work for simply because they're so known and there was a great position there. But if I was real with myself, when I was real with myself, I, I, I you know, I, I realized I don't want that intensity right now. 
and turns out that you know I made way more money in advisory than I ever could in house, and it was a way better kind of um, uh, lifestyle where I don't have to manage people. Um, and I could focus on some other things that I really enjoyed, like the newsletter, uh, like speaking at conferences, et cetera. So it turned out really well, but there wasn't this grand plan. I got kind of kicked out of my orbit uh, by being laid off. You know what? I think a lot of people in the industry has a similar story. You know, I don't know anyone that's in the position that they are who said, yes, this was all planned. <laughs> I mean, for me, I, I, God, I've over the past 23 years, nothing's really been planned. I didn't plan to be a professional speaker. It just happened. You know, suddenly one day someone said, Mark, will you come and speak down London and we'll pay you four figures? And I'm like, what? Four figures? And I jumped at it, you know. You know, it just started. Things just happen. And I think sometimes those are the best ways. And what you said about understanding what you didn't want to do is more important than just taking anything on. So when you're going in advising, I mean, for me, I the one thing I love about advising is I don't have to employ anybody. I go in to advise companies that already have resources available. They just need direction and streamlining. And that's one thing I love because, you know, it's not that I'm bad at management. I'm very good at it. But it's not what I want to do or enjoy. You know, it's it's making that real difference. And I think with yourself... What sort of level of involvement do you have with the companies you're advising? It's a fantastic question because that's something that's where I often have to do a bit of um, explaining or educational work. So as an advisor, I focus completely on the strategic side of things. So I don't do keyword research. I don't do tech audits. I will dive into very specific problems because uh, I come from technical SEO, right? So I can I can still do that um, for, for most of it, but uh, I will not write content or content briefs, but I will help companies understand where in their execution they make big mistakes, where they have gaps, where they should invest, where they should hire, um, how to think about SEO as a, as a channel for the company. So I have, you know, I have frameworks that I bring to companies um, regarding different types of companies. So, for example, if you know, if a company that that grows predominantly through through self created content, right? Like I do have these anchor points where I say, okay, these are five things you need to take into account. Here are some best practices. Here are some things you should you should you know uh, include in your workflow. So I will help them stand up the execution, but I will not be involved. And the way that I think about it is that you know at the um, uh, at the, at, the, at the execution level, you have the freelancer. If you need somebody to come in and write 50 content briefs, that's work typically done by freelancers. And a, a bit further removed is a consultant. And the consultant kind of helps maybe with the keyword research or maybe some competitor research, something that's a bit more high level, not directly operational, but also not at this most strategic level. At the most strategic level, you have the advisor, right? So as an advisor, I come in and say, okay, look, uh, this is how to think about healthy growth rates for SEO, for example. Or we here's an opportunity, but we're not sufficiently staffed. We're not sufficiently invested. Or how do we validate SEO as a channel? So it's like these very, very high-level questions that basically CMOs will typically think about. And that's why my my biggest clientele is, uh, or my, my typical uh, uh, points of contact are, C-suites, VPs, directors. I typically, and I will, I will coach teams. I will mentor teams, right? That that is included. But uh, the the questions that I help answer are at the at the highest management level. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Good. You do you see yourself at the C-suite level within the business? So does do the C-suite take your advice? realistically or do you know that yes you said this so we need to make it happen 
you know, because the last thing that, you know, as an advisor wants is to go into a company and try to solve everything and nothing actually gets implemented. That happens. That happens. Uh, and, and, you know, when that happens, that is also an incredibly valuable lesson, right? Uh, I will have sometimes early on when I come into a company and sometimes a bit later when I work uh, with the company, we'll have these inflection points where we look back at what work was actually done. And then sometimes, you know, we'll realize actually not much got done. And the valuable lesson here is why. What ha what prevented us from getting the work done? Was it that we didn't have enough people to do the actual work? Was it that the work wasn't prioritized because it wasn't scoped properly? Was it that there wasn't a clear path to what the work should actually be, right? Like those are some of the most valuable explorations and value contributions you can bring as an advisor. That is a, a fundamental issue in the engine of how the company works. Um, but yeah, typically I get very open ears uh, from, from uh, decision makers. Um, what really helps is that I was able to collect a lot of experience at companies that, that operate and work at a very high level, like Shopify, right? So when you come from Shopify, you said, look, I, I led, you know, blah, blah, blah. I had this experience, this is what I did. Then people will trust your word more um, a lot of times. And, you know, part of that is debatable and questionable, but the other part is just that, you know, people value experience and people will listen to you, especially when you come in as an outsider, right? When you're not that deep in the weeds and you have more of an objective view. And a lot of clients I work with, they want that. And it's so interesting because, you know, when I worked in house, you had to make cases for certain things. You had to test, you had to, you know, have all these like documents and math behind it and whatnot. And then as an advisor, I will be honest, I have the luxury of sometimes just being able and, and come into and whisper into the CEO's ear to do something and it gets done. Uh, and I know this is, it might not be fair, right? But um, that's, that's how things work. And I try to use that as responsibly as I possibly can, but yeah, that is a, that is a reality. Now I will, to, to take that responsibility, I will talk to teams. I will collect as much information as possible. I will build the math out for myself still in the background because of, I've, I've done it for so many years, but reality is, you know, I can, as, as a, as an advisor, I can go to a CEO and say, um, I think we should, we should stop investing in content and figure out a programmatic SEO play or, I think we need to. I think we need to hire five more people, and it will it will be on the agenda. Yeah, I think <laughs> I, I can relate to that. Obviously, on not on that higher level, but like I've been into companies myself, and like that the SEO team said, oh, "We just can't get buying." So, well, I want to understand why not. What have you done to to enable that? And usually. It's because they haven't given the C-suite enough information to make an informed decision. You know, because, awesome. because the teams are very good at doing what they do, but suddenly they pl they plonked in this situation where they need to get buy-in and they're not they haven't got the tools to do that. And I think a lot of it to understand what it is that the CFO needs to release more money or what is it? And I think on that higher level, it's important for someone like yourself to, to go in that understands those things. A hundred percent. Making a business case is a skill, right? A lot of people think it's just, oh, you need to tell a good story. And sure, that's a bit part of it. But, uh, or why doesn't the CEO see this technical problem, right? Like our canonicals are broken, but you you, know, you have to make it digestible and relatable and, and you have to talk money, right? So I, I've created so much content around that and been so vocal around that, but it's still something that I see on a repeated basis. Part of the problem is that there is this black box element to SEO, right? And there is a an imperfect predictability of what will happen in SEO, which makes many people shy away from saying, oh, give me a million dollars and I'll bring you $5 million, right? That's very intimidating. Or even just give me 100,000, I'll bring you a million, right? You can scale it down, but it's still intimidating because at the end of the day, SEO is very probabilistic, right? It's statistics, not math. We can we can say, oh, if we do X, then there's an 80% chance that Y will happen, but not 100% chance. But if you give the pay team a million dollars, they can say with pretty high accuracy that, oh yeah, I'm gonna bring you back five or whatever. That's It's a very different way. 
Uh, and on top of that comes the time component where sometimes SEO just takes a while, depending on what we're talking about. So that makes many people shy away or many SEOs shy away from making very specific business cases, but you need to develop that skill and muscle. Otherwise, you will most likely not be successful in-house unless you have one of the few CEOs in the world who have experience in SEO, who understand how SEO works and who you have a high trust relationship with uh, and, and can just say, this is what we need to do and, and, and you can you can get it done. That is very rare, right? In most cases, you have to come to the table with a strong business case and that's a skill. Yeah. For yourself, working with these mega businesses who, you know, have what I think is an awful lot of organic traffic already, you know, when you're working at such a high level, and advising companies, what do you personally feel yourself like? My decisions, you know, is even a tiny little tweak could create a big impact one way or another. So for you personally, how do you think about that yourself when you're advising companies to say, well, you know, this will, we think it's going to create this, but you know, it's it's like we're talking massive numbers. We're not talking, you know, a couple of hundred more people. So for, how do you handle that? I call it personal pressure, I suppose, that's on yourself. Yeah, sure. There's a lot of pressure. And the way to mitigate that pressure is actually meta thinking. So meta thinking is how to think about thinking. Uh, and I don't want to become too philosophical, but at the end of the day, what you want is a logic, a structure, or a framework for how to make these decisions. Because otherwise, it's all just gut decision, right? It's all just gut feeling. Gut feeling, it can work. So I have a pretty trained gut, right? Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, I want my gut and my brain to work together here. And so the way to make that happen is you, again, you want to develop a strong logic. Um, a strong logic can come from asking yourself five times why. I, I want to to set, I don't know, half of our pages to no index or block and robots TXT. Okay, why? Okay, because of this. Why? Okay, because of that. Why? Because, okay, now we're getting some depth into the decision. Another way to come to that uh, uh, point or to, to alleviate some pressure is to think about what would de-risk that decision. Okay, so we want to set half of our website, all of half of our URLs to meta no index. What if we start with 10%? What if we start with a low risk way and we test into that and we measure the impact, right? So is there a way to do to make the decision at a smaller scale? And then you know, also another way to de-risk a decision is to think about, can we reverse that quickly? Um, there is a, a company that I work with that where we're working more on product-led growth than SEO really, but essentially they have, let's just call it a widget that users can implement those widgets get billions of views every year. And um, we're thinking about adding a link back to the company into that widget, which of course comes with a certain risk, right? Because we know that Google doesn't want you to, to you know, use widgets for link building. But at the same time, there could be, there is value in bringing users back to the homepage so that they can create their own bit widget, right? So how can we de-risk that? What can we do to quickly undo that change or that, that decision if we see a negative impact, right? And so a lot of the pressure can be alleviated by thinking about how to make the decision and thinking about de-risking the decision and thinking about how to reverse the decision very fast. And so these these coming to those conclusions is something that doesn't typically happen in isolation. It typically happens as a common decision with executive buy-in, right? And so you go through the hoops there, through the motions, and you will discover a lot of traps of making these decisions and approaches to 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 getting closer to that full decision and that takes away a lot of the pressure right so i would shy away from coming in and just telling the ceo you have to set 50 percent of your else to no index and i think a better way to to make that decision would be okay let's talk to the teams let's understand why that hasn't happened so far let's test into that and let's set ourselves, let, let's set that deploy up in a way that we can quickly undo it if it turns out to be the wrong decision. Right. Yeah, I've, I've always been a big believer in let's do a small test. 
let's prove the concept, proof of concept, I've called it, you call it, you know, on a minor level before we start chasing the big things. Um, now, for you, you yourself, what has been the biggest learning curve in your career? Man, the biggest learning curve, um, I would probably say there are two things. Uh, one was when I developed an understanding between the different types of sites and how they work. I paint my worldview with two brushes. One brush is what I call integrators. And integrators have to create the content themselves, right? They're typically SaaS companies or direct to consumer e commerce companies where they don't have, they have to, like, they basically scale with articles, blog content, landing pages lead generation tools. And the other brush is what I call aggregators. And aggregators typically have user-generated content or a large product inventory. Um, so they don't create the content themselves. Maybe they have a block at some point in time, right? But most of the traffic comes from scalable landing pages. Like a TripAdvisor is a great example. Um, an Instacart is a great example. An Uber Eats is a great example. Amazon, eBay, Walmart, right? They have product inventories or user-generated content that they build their whole SEO strategy around. And examples for integrators are Atlassian, for example, right? There's no, uh, maybe Trello is an outlier, right? But like for Jira and Confluence, they create all the content themselves. Um, maybe, let's see, what is another big example? Apple could be another example, even though they have uh, uh, aggregator elements like their, their um, app store, um, you know, they create a lot of the content themselves or um, let's see, Warby Parker or Hims, right? Th these are companies that create content themselves. As you can already tell, there are, there are crossovers between both of these types, but that's that's essentially how I differentiate. So Atlassian, where I work, for example, that's an integrator. So you really have to focus on content creation, maintenance, landing pages, microsites, those kind of things. And then I joined G2 and it's a completely different ball game because it's an aggregator and they're you know, it really matters that like you get your the pages that are indexed under control um, or what's called indexing management. Um, how do you improve the quality of reviews? How do you improve uh, category pages, right? It's a completely different focus area. So I'd say that was a, a, one of the biggest uh, realizations that I had. And the other one is about, about management and how to get things done and how to run an organization. Um, and I, I, you know, I was, I was fortunate to, to make big jumps. So at Atlassian was basically a head off. At G2, I was a VP. And then at Shopify, I was a director. Um, and so my responsibility grew very quickly within a few years. And that that was a very steep learning curve. And luckily, I had people who taught me a lot and good frameworks to help me sort through that. But um, yeah, I would, I would probably call these, uh, these two uh, realizations out. Right. Now, as a growth advisor, what do these companies expect from you yeah it's funny uh, you know was, uh, i mentioned earlier sometimes uh, companies expect that i come in and, and basically do the work but most of the time companies realize that my biggest value is sharing the experience that i that i made uh and helping them think a certain way make decisions a certain way in the framework so i would say 80 percent of the time clients understand that that my value is on the strategic level and uh they they send me things for feedback we bounce ideas off of each other, um, and uh, we do things like roadmap critique, design critique, um, and and engineering critique. So um, that's typically what companies expect from me. Essentially, they, they want they want me to help them grow revenue, right? Like that's that's the ultimate goal, of course. But uh, you know, from from organic traffic to revenue, there there typically steps in between where I help companies the most. Is it a case that? They bring you in because they've tried to do it themselves and haven't got to where they want to be, or is it they they've come up with the idea when they know where they want to be, so they want some outside specialist to come in. I mean, what I'm trying to understand from an outside perspective is why these, you know, what situation are these companies in? 50% of the time, companies have tried to do it and it didn't work for them. And so they want somebody to come in and tell them what they did wrong. And the other 50% of time, companies want to invest more in SEO and they want to 
de-risk it from scratch as much as possible. So they want to bring in outside expertise, basically somebody who has done it before to make sure they avoid the most, like most of the traps that they can avoid. Yeah. Now, if I personally was, I'd say younger, uh, so I wasn't on my semi-retirement plan, and as someone that is an advisor who goes into companies, I mean, but I've never worked on like the massive blue chip companies, you know, how could somebody like me start advising and going into companies that you advise? Or is it possible or isn't it? <laughs> See, I haven't done the the split test. I haven't uh, I haven't gone back in time and 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 uh, you know lived a different life to to tell exactly what works and what doesn't. But telling from my own experience, right? Like I um, I created a lot of surface area for these for, for this to happen by being very present on social networks and by being on podcasts and speaking and putting content out there, right? Through my through my newsletter and blogs. Uh, so that increased my my surface area and luck and chance. But another way is to just simply offer some of your work for free. So if I were to go back, say, I don't know, five, 10 years, and I, I told myself, look, I want to go down the advisor track. How can I set myself up for success right now? I would carve out a little bit of time every week to advise companies for free and reach out to them and say, look, I want to sharpen my skills as an advisor. Uh, I offer you my knowledge for free. But in return, you know, I want to be able to list you as a client or I want you to tell me what I could do better, right? I want to learn with you. And I think that's very attractive for many companies. It doesn't always have to be, you know, Fortune 50 or so. Like, it, it, And I would also want to challenge that these are the best clients to have. Uh, not that they're the worst, right? But I'm just, I'm just, I just want to say there are a, a surprisingly high number of companies that need advisors who you might have never heard of, but they... They make a ton of money or they really benefit from SEO. So um, I think it's easy to just, you know, aim for the Fortune 50 uh, and, and disregard how many other incredible companies there are. But uh, yeah, offering work for free, gaining that experience um, and also increasing the chances for word of mouth. I have to say that um, more clients than I expected actually come from recommendations and referrals. I thought that the majority come from uh, LinkedIn in my newsletter. And uh, the reality is that, you know, 50% come from referrals and 25% from my newsletter and 25% from LinkedIn. Wonderful. Now, is there anything we haven't spoken about yet that you believe that's really valuable for the audience to understand? Well, Mark, so much. We could probably talk for hours. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, um, I think one thing that's important to understand is that I have had a unique path and a lot of luck in my career. And I've been very outgoing. I've been very, very much out there. And I don't think that you need to do that. I think there is, there's a range, right? Like there is, you need to be out there somewhat, but probably not as much as, as I am. And I just want people to understand that. I also want to say that you can probably be too much out there and that can be a negative signal. So, you know, uh, I just want to, like, there are different perceptions and uh, uh, everybody has their unique style and preference. Uh, it has worked out for me greatly to, to really put myself out there and share my ideas because I've gotten a lot of feedback and I've gotten into a lot of helpful conversations when I do that, but it doesn't have to be that way. And if you don't feel comfortable doing that, then there are different ways to be successful. Uh, but as we already talked about, you know, success can take many forms and shapes. And even if that means money, then there are many paths to the money. It doesn't always have to be managing as many people as possible or speaking at many conferences around the world or doing advisory. There are many different paths. And the, the advice that I want to give to everybody listening is to be honest with yourself, draft a vision for what you want and be like, ask yourself, what do I really want? How do I want to live? Like, you know, those are important questions to to deal with, but give yourself some space to acknowledge that there are many paths and you can probably find a path that works best for you. Wonderful. Now, just to finalize, what conversations would you like to have with people and where can they find you? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. I love that. Uh, conversations that I want to have is really what what are the biggest struggles that people are dealing with? What do they want to learn more about? Um, I want to 
create content that helps people or share my knowledge in a way that helps people. So uh, yeah, I'm mostly curious about that. Uh, and you can find me on X and LinkedIn. I use my real name, Kevin Indyk, on both of these platforms. And of course, uh, my newsletter, Growth Memo, which you find on growth-memo.com. There is an imposter called The Growth Memo, and they're not the real Growth Memo, so I just want to point that out. Uh, but uh, yeah, growth-memo.com. Uh, it's a Substack newsletter. Um, would love to see you there. Well, Kevin, many thanks for your time today. And I'm sure the audience have found it highly valuable. I appreciate it, Mark. This was a pleasure. Thanks for having me on.